Disclaimer, Square Enix sent me a review code early for Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. I was not paid from them for my views. All thoughts are mine and mine alone. Also, spoilers ahead for almost everything regarding the original Final Fantasy VII remake, Crisis Core, and Reunion. Basically everything Final Fantasy VII, so you've been warned. Final Fantasy VII is one of the most influential role-playing games of all time. Due to its incredible cast of characters, dazzling music and art direction, and very impactful story, the 1997 game is so beloved by its creators and fans that years after its release, Square Enix decided to expand that universe even further with the development of the Final Fantasy VII compilation. There was the CG animated movie sequel called Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which takes place years after the events of the original game, and there was also the spin off Dirge of Cerberus, which focused on fan-favorite secret character Vincent Valentine. Square Enix even developed a prequel before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, a mobile game that focused on the Turks that was never made available here in the West, but whose story will be recreated and released as Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis sometime in 2023, amongst other stories in the franchise. But none of these games carry the weight and impact for me of Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII an action RPG only available on the PlayStation Portable that focuses on the life and times of one Zack Fair, member of Soldier. Without Zack, the entire Final Fantasy VII universe would look completely different. Now, in the wake of 2020's Final Fantasy VII Remake, Square Enix has provided a remaster of this prequel. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion is an altogether streamlined and improved version of the original Crisis Core. Revisiting the story of Zack is just as powerful as ever and is a reminder as to why these characters are so beloved. Hey everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Completionist, or The Completionist New Game Plus, or a documentary that I made several years ago. Whatever it is, welcome back to the show where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. I'm excited to play Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion, which is a newer version of an older game that I have completed at least three or four times in my lifetime. And any of you guys know, if you're an old school fan of The Completionist, with the original New Game Plus lineup, I did a series that was dedicated to a documentary style-esque look at Final Fantasy VII. And Crisis Core was at the pinnacle center for me personally in how I talked about the entire franchise. The legacy of Zack Fair and his arc over the course of Crisis Core has always stuck with me. But I'm not gonna be giving a rating to this game because of the fact that the first time I talked about this game for the show, it was in service of a documentary style project that we called Final Fantasy VII Month which was an in-depth look at almost everything regarding Final Fantasy VII. Now, looking at that, I'm proud to say that yes, we are gonna be redoing that documentary for you guys someday in the future. I say someday in the future because that is going to be made outside of the New Game Plus lineup. So New Game Plus will end, and then this documentary is gonna come out several years later. The reason why I'm doing that is because I'm waiting for a remake and all the sequels that are coming out in the following years. So. With that said, Crisis Core Reunion is an interesting place for me personally, because I don't consider it a part of the original 120 lineup of The Completionist. It doesn't land in that New Game Plus territory, as there's not really original rating. So, I'm going to break my usual format just a little bit here, and say there will be no rating on this game. I have been wanting to recreate my journey through this world. The landscape has completely shifted with the release of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, part 1 of Remake is out now. The intermission DLC is out now, and we're waiting for the eventual sequels. And thus, here we are with Crisis Core. This Crisis Core re-release slash remaster slash remake seemed like the perfect time to revisit its legacy. And there are still so many unknowns regarding any upcoming remake sequels. Zack Fair's Odyssey, filled with joy, heartache, and passion, remains one of the most impactful character arcs for this show and for me personally. Now, I may not be giving Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion a completionist rating, but Let's just say that even though completing it is definitely a nightmare, it is a journey worth experiencing. And yes, you guessed it, there will be spoilers for Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII Remake, and of course, Crisis Core and Reunion. With that said, let's go. Yes! All glory goes to the winner! Oh! 
The road to a prettier version of one of the top 10 best-selling PlayStation Portable games ever made may seem like a direct one, but Crisis Core Reunion is actually the first time many players will be able to experience this story. Sony's decision to lock this game to the PSP for almost 15 years severely limited its audience. Factor in that the original Crisis Core was only available on the UMD, Sony's proprietary little mini-disc system for the PSP, and never made the jump to a digital release on the PSP. Go or Vita or any other platform, and you've got a recipe for making this spinoff feel incredibly niche. With this newly minted iteration, Crisis Core is finally available to a mainstream audience on literally every major platform, including the Xbox series of consoles and the Nintendo Switch. No longer trapped in the Sony ecosystem, Crisis Core can thrive. From a preservation perspective, I see this as an absolute win. It's just in time as well, as over the last few years, Final Fantasy VII Remake has piqued a lot of interest in Crisis Core's main character, Zack Fair. Again, real quick, if you are not familiar with Final Fantasy VII or its 2020 remake, and be warned, spoilers are abound. Crisis Core's entire reason for being is to fill in and flesh out some of the story gaps related to Cloud, Sephiroth, the Turks, Shinra Corporation proper, Tifa, and Aerith. Zack's legacy is complicated and best expressed within the context of the full story of Final Fantasy VII. Got it? Good. So essentially, Shinra Corp, a power company that makes everything from killer robots to cars to power plants, has this private military sector. They're pretty tough, but they also have the equivalent of a special ops unit called Soldier. Imagine if SEAL Team 6 had an entire crew of Captain America level superpowered humans, and that's what you're left with. Soldier members are strong, loyal, and more importantly, juiced up with Mako energy thanks to the gaggle of mad scientists on Shinra's payroll. The best members of Soldier are promoted to first class, reserved for legendary heroes like Sephiroth. Zack Fair, our player character, longs to reach first class. But Sephiroth is not the only aspirational figure here. There are two more first class soldiers. There's Genesis, a romantic poetic warrior who is obsessed with this play called Loveless. And then there's Angeal, Zack's stoic buster sword wielding mentor who cares deeply about everyone and everything. Over the course of the game, Zack goes from an enthusiastic cheerleader of Shinra and soldier to a disillusioned warrior who sees the cracks in the system and the exploitation of the common man. But through it all, he does his best to hold on to the ideals that Angeal taught him. Honor, respect, and loyalty. Getting to know Zack and his relationship to all these characters is the heart of Crisis Core. Through cutscenes, in-game dialogue, and many various character emails, players come to understand why Zack cares so much about Angeal's approval, and why Genesis and Sephiroth are such towering figures in not just his own life, but the life of his fellow infantrymen and individual friend Cloud Strife. However, Crisis Core isn't just cutscene after cutscene. At its heart, it is a third-person action RPG spin-off within the Final Fantasy VII universe. And even though I don't want to give this game a rating, I'm still presenting this video from the lens of the completion experience. Crisis Core is a surprisingly dense game, and completing it on the PS5 takes a lot of effort in the form of 51 trophies and all the manner of in-game completion statistics. Though, it is significantly easier if you've completed the PSP version several times before so you know where to look as there are many missable items, missions, and moments. Now, to be clear, Crisis Core is not a turn-based RPG like the original Final Fantasy VII. Instead of party-based combat, players control only Zack. This game folds in some elements from other action games like blocking and dodging and rolling, and keeps some Final Fantasy staples like materia and basic equipment. Combat is fast, with some battles taking literally seconds to finish. Players must exploit elemental weaknesses and stay on top of equipment loadouts to have a chance of completing this game's toughest combat challenges. One of the most interesting and dare I say controversial systems in Crisis Core is the Digital Mind Wave, the DMW, a slot machine that sits in the corner of the screen that is constantly spinning and dishing out bonuses to Zack himself during battle. The DMW is both the best and worst thing about combat. This roulette wheel determines pretty much everything related to the fight, including summons, several different character limit breaks, 
and even leveling up. On the one hand, battles always feel fresh because you never know what you're gonna get, whether it's an invincibility buff or a blast of Aerith's healing wave. On the other hand, you might not level up for two hours of gameplay because it seems that for some reason or other, you just can't hit those lucky sevens. The only way that Zack can actually level up is to get three sevens in a row. The game even makes a point of saying that there is no way to check Zack's experience points, which is kind of a common issue with this game that people have. What people don't really know or understand or realize is that each monster in the game does have a hidden value for experience points. So if you've killed a ton of these enemies, the more likely you have of a chance to getting level ups. There have been several occasions where I would get level up after level up after level up, because I've harnessed so many experience points and just never ranked up by the luck of the draw. The DMW also serves as a window into Zack's emotions. It's not just a slot machine with numbers. There are character portraits mixed in as well. Line up three of the same character to power up. And sometimes you can even watch a short cutscene highlighting an important moment from Zack's life with that person that might have happened off camera. Unfortunately, to get 100% DMW imagery for all of the characters, you just have to get lucky on the draw. Fortunately, there are a lot of things that Zack can control. This game is divided into 10 chapters with a short prologue. Every chapter has major revelations and plot twists. The player has freedom to explore before progressing the story. Areas are not nearly as detailed or full of NPCs as the environments of Final Fantasy VII Remake, but there are plenty of side quests to find and people to talk to. Outside of the main plot line and a handful of NPCs at Shinra HQ and the surrounding sectors, the other main thing to complete are these missions. There are a whopping 300 missions to tackle. These are accessed by simply arriving at a save point and going to the menu. Every mission is essentially a mini dungeon. Most require the player to defeat a specific enemy after exploring a small space, grabbing a couple items along the way. Nothing too complicated here, but there are a lot of them. Fortunately, the game does keep track of your mission completion percentage and even rewards the player with items and materia as they complete more and more. Now on average, finishing one mission does tend to unlock the next one, though there are a fair amount that are only available after certain story moments or meeting the correct NPC. Completing missions is the only way to find the best equipment and summons in the game. Now, because this is the PS5 version, or rather a modern version of this game, there are trophies and achievements. And there is one difficulty-based trophy for Crisis Core. So, of course, I started playing the game on the hardest mode rather than normal. There is also a New Game Plus option once you beat the game, though finishing the game on this setting is not tied to any sort of reward or bonus. New Game Plus may not yield anything new, but there is still a ton of stuff to do for completionists. The complete Completion process is where Crisis Core Reunion shows its strengths and its limits. Though the overall package is much easier to digest than its PSP predecessor, playing this game in the modern age shows really how far we've come. Today's video is sponsored and brought to you by G Fuel. For those of you guys that don't know, G Fuel has been a sponsor of the show for many years and they're giving us one last push for the end of the year to save you some money on your favorite flavors. For those of you guys not in the know, G Fuel is a supplement that you put into a cup of water or maybe a milk if you want to get a little more on the on the uh, tea or, or chocolatey side, depending on the flavor that you get, and you stir it up, or in this case, you can go to gfuel.com, pick up a shaker to go with it, and you shake it up until it's all mixed together. Uh, there's no sugar, there is some caffeine, uh, but in the end, it's delicious flavors that people tend to enjoy, and a lot of brands have partnered with G Fuel, so you can get a Mega Man flavor. Uh, I did not get my own flavor or shaker, but hey, that's okay, because there's other crews out there that you can enjoy their flavor with. So, if you want to get some G Fuel today, head over to gfuel.com and use code completionist to save yourself some money. Again, gfuel.com, code completionist on checkout. Using this code supports us. We appreciate it. Thank you to G Fuel, and now, back to the show. I'll admit it, I'm pretty much a sucker for mostly anything Final Fantasy VII adjacent. That world speaks to me in a way that few other game settings do. 
Part of what makes completing Crisis Core enjoyable is being able to spend more time in that world and appreciating its strengths. I could talk at length about the themes and character motivations, and I'm going to later, but the actual completion process of this game is ultimately a double-edged buster sword. You can complete the story of Crisis Core and hit all the emotional highs and lows in less than 10 hours. Would it surprise you to know that I've almost spent 100 hours completing Crisis Core? The story and characters are probably the most things that players care about. It's certainly what I think were the strongest parts of the game, yet the plot takes up only a fraction of the playtime, as each story mission takes only about 30 minutes to an hour and a half tops to finish. The dozens of hours I spent completing Crisis Core can be attributed to a few different factors, including a nice big old helping of RNG. But there are a few helpful changes that stand out as massive highlights to Reunion. Crisis Core Reunion does an amazing job at modernizing a 15-year-old handheld focused game. Many of these changes are for the better, specifically during battle. Camera movement is much smoother and more intuitive. The DMW no longer pauses the action during battle. Now it just runs automatically in the corner. And there are two other huge changes that make combat significantly more enjoyable. First off, dying in battle no longer means you have to restart a mission from the very beginning or return to the last save point. Instead, if you die during a fight, you are prompted to choose some options from a menu. This is a great change and meant that I was never out of action for too long. There are definitely a few battles where enemies can cast powerful elemental spells like Try Thundaga or Hell Thundaga that can one-shot Zack if you're not wearing the right equipment. And being able to adjust for that quickly is a godsend. Now the other huge new addition to combat is related to the Buster Sword. In Chapter 6, around halfway through the game, Zack finally gains access to the iconic Buster Sword that will eventually end up in Cloud's hands. This new weapon replaces Zack's old sword, but lets him approach combat very differently. By swapping stances with a touch of a few buttons, Zack can deal massive damage and guard against attacks more efficiently. Furthermore, if Zack meets certain conditions in battle, he'll now gain bonus HP, MP, or AP on victory. The flip side of the coin here is that now, Zack has an additional thing to level up to 100%. Bustard Sword Proficiency. Players can now level up how proficient Zack is by switching to battle stances and killing enemies with strong attacks, blocking while in the stance, or using some type of command materia. The rate at which proficiency increases is pretty slow, but if you're grinding for full completion anyway, hitting 100% is achievable. Now, in its current state on consoles, if you are playing this game, most people get through 95% on their buster proficiency and they claim that it will be a bug of some kind. And it's kind of true because looking at how the buster sword levels up is very bizarre. There's three soft caps. So once you've reached a certain amount of percentage by attacking in battle stance, using the command materia in battle stance or guarding, you just naturally stop gaining proficiency. What most people don't know is that you actually gain skills upon hitting benchmarks while you are leveling up your proficiency. So for example, you might get Barrier Piercer, which allows you to do damage to certain folks who are necessarily protecting themselves from a spell or physical attack. With Barrier Pierce, you can attack through those spells, right? But what most people don't actually know is that you gain an additional 5% if you actually kill enemies who have barrier on. You have to grind for about 30 minutes or so, and then voila, you've got it. But to circle back on the glitch aspect of this, it's currently glitched on Steam, and various reports across the internet are conflicting. For a while, it was said you can't get 100%, only 95. Now it can be 100%, but sometimes the skills you unlock are random and not appropriate. Sometimes you just get a random burst of 10% proficiency, which no one knows how or why. You also might get a bump if you see all of Angel's cutscenes in his DMW. The information is all over the place, but I do want to give a huge shout out to fellow content creator Schrodinger's Baby Seal. They have been putting in the work on getting all the information out there regarding Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion, and they helped me in this entire process. So shout outs to them, go subscribe, links in the box down below. So these new features, particularly the battle stance, make grinding through missions much more enjoyable, especially on harder difficulties. The combat of Crisis Core was already pretty solid, almost a preview of what would eventually appear in Final Fantasy VII Remake. These little tweaks are perfect for people new to the game, as they make things a lot more approachable. 
To give you guys a little more context, when you're playing the PlayStation Portable version of the game, you have to use L1 and R1 to kind of sift through what spells or attacks or commands are on deck. There's a dedicated dodge button, but any other thing you do, you would have to relegate down to using L1 and R1 to make a decision. Like a hybrid hack and slash, but ATB situation. In Reunion, they did something fantastic. They borrowed the spell system from Kingdom Hearts. So now if you hold L1 and one of the many materias, you can now do a command on the fly without having to sift through a different menu. These small and subtle changes do a fantastic job of welcoming new players who have never played this game before to a much more palatable and fun time. Seriously, all these changes that showed up, whenever they did show up, rocked me to my core with such huge successes. I was so excited. But let's move on to what we all know already, as in the missions. Missions are easily Crisis Core's weakest element. They are repetitive and often dull. Some are necessary. It's difficult to progress without doing a healthy handful of them. Going to a menu and selecting a mission is so divorced from all the things that make Midgar one of the most memorable locations in gaming that it can be disappointing to realize that the missions make up the bulk of playtime in Crisis Core. That said, I also appreciated the parts of Crisis Core that remained the same. For example, Materia Fusion and completely breaking the game. Materia Fusion breaks the game, no joke. This trick I'm gonna show you works on all stat categories as long as you pay attention to your items. Let's get Quake to have 99900% to HP. Take Quake and add Libra to it. It will come out to Quake and it will add any stats from Libra to the Quake Materia, as long as the Materias are not mastered. Before you do this, however, add Add 98 of one of the few mixable and farmable items like Mithril. This will create a Quake that has plus 99 to your spirit stat. Then grab that same Quake one more time and mix it with yet another Libra. But this time add one Fat Chocobo Feather. Fat Chocobo Feathers give 10% to your total HP via Materia Fusion. Because the Materia is not maxed out in stats, the mixing item changes the stat completely. So now you've got Quake with 999% to HP. You can repeat this to get max stats on almost all of your materia, as Mithril and Dark Matter are easy to farm. By the time you're done, you might have something that looks as awesome as this in Soldier. With more summons, equipment slots, and better gear, Zack will become the most effective combatant in all of Final Fantasy. Taking Crisis Core, originally built for handheld systems, and bringing it to other platforms is ultimately a win. But completing it on the PS5, you'll definitely notice a few of this game's weaknesses. Missions are short, which is kind of good, definitely meant to be played in spurts during a commute or brief moments before the bell rings between classes at school. Cranking through 30 of them at one time on my couch is way less enjoyable. Now, I love to marathon long RPGs, don't get me wrong, but the way Crisis Core is constructed from a gameplay perspective doesn't necessarily translate to that big screen. Visually, it's incredibly stunning, certainly closer to Final Fantasy VII Remake aesthetically. Cutscenes in particular are beautiful. Music is amazing, which I've always loved. Because the core components of this game are meant to be played on the go in short bursts, it can feel exhausting to play a lot of Crisis Core all at once, considering there are 300 missions that you have to complete. Also, shout outs to the localization team at Square Enix, who works in this game. You can't confirm or deny, because I have no idea, but uh, a lot of the trophies have completionist in them. So uh, if you're watching this, thank you, and I love you. Completing all 51 trophies isn't that bad, to be honest. If you're a fan of this game, it's pretty straightforward. But for those of us completionists out there who are going in for the first time, or maybe it's been many, many years, every chapter now has a few chapter-specific achievements. Be confident, stay diligent, and most importantly, don't be afraid to save often. You can never save enough. It's pretty obvious which chapter has which trophy, but if you're that concerned, I recommend just looking up a trophy guide, as there is no chapter select. This whole drag feels especially noticeable when you start trying to max out the percentage of all the characters' cutouts on the DMW screen. There are some ways to manipulate which character portraits will show up. Honestly, all you have to do is get the character materias, buy them in bulk, choose a really easy mission that you can't die on, 
and you'll be fine. Set it and forget it for a couple hours. But even with luck on your side, this can still be a struggle to max out all these portraits to 100%. Unlocking the portraits themselves isn't that difficult. And the summons are really easy, like Bahamut or Ifrit. Once you get the limit break once, you're good to go. Maxing out the character portraits gets a little more complicated. Viewing every memory associated with each character requires the player to have progressed through most of the story. So you can't max out each character portrait until you're almost at the very end of the game. So if you're in chapter nine and you haven't seen every memory yet, you have your work cut out for you. Fortunately, there are purple materia out there that can increase the likelihood of seeing the memories of certain characters. And if you roll Cisne's Limit Break Lucky Stars, you can further increase the chances of getting those things to proc. If you are planning on fully completing this game, you're probably going to have to replay a lot of missions to get more chances to roll that dice in the hopes that the lucky number comes up. And by lucky number, I mean Sephiroth's face. Unlike in other RPGs where I'll grind to the highest level possible just because I can, to the outsider looking in, getting level 99 in Crisis Core seems like a crapshoot. But when you know what to do, it's not. It's actually fairly easy to get to 99. But it's certainly not required that you even reach even half of that level to beat the story. Because that's what Crisis Core is all about, really. The story. If this game sounds kind of dry to you based on everything I've said so far, don't be fooled. As a game, Crisis Core is great. As another brick in the wall of the Final Fantasy verse, it is a crucial cornerstone. The longer I make content on the internet, the more concerned I become with legacy. It's been a theme that has grown to be more and more important to me over the last few years. Recently, I've written and produced a live show called The Completionist Legacy, where I detail my journey and how I came to where I am today. And believe it or not, but a lot of what inspired that show was by Zack Fair's character arc in Crisis Core. When I first met Zack in the original Final Fantasy VII, it was at Cloud's lowest point. When Cloud is basically having a mental break with reality and conflating his own memories with that of Zack. It's one of the darkest moments in a pretty dark game. Ever since then, I've always wanted to know more about Zack. Crisis Core expands that character to someone I would grow to love. Even through all of his trials and trauma, Zack Zack's optimism and steadfast adherence to the principles of his mentor Angeal have always resonated with me. The lifeblood of Crisis Core is basically the lead up to and fallout from the Nimbleheim incident in Final Fantasy VII. This entire game is essentially reverse engineered to provide context just for that moment. But even before Nibbleheim, the game builds up Zack and his relationships. In the beginning of the story, Zack is eager to express his loyalty to Shinra. He wants to be a hero no matter what the cost, just like his idols and friends. But he doesn't really know what that means. His first major assignment is to help end the war against the Wu Tai, and that mission gets tinged with shades of gray by the end of that mission. Zack and Angeal discover that Genesis, the other soldier first class, has defected against Shinra and their team. This heavily impacts Angeal because they were best friends growing up, and seeing how Angeal starts to question his superiors makes Zack start to wonder if maybe there is more to being a good person than just following orders. It's a very, hey, are we the baddies kind of vibe throughout the the game. The first half of the game is an examination of what happens when we idolize our heroes and they disappoint us. When Genesis defects from Shinra, Angeal is essentially broken, which of course then affects Zack as well. Zack never falls into despair. Even when he learns that Genesis and Angeal are monsters, essentially superpowered lab rats, he takes it in stride. Unlike Genesis, who's decided to seek a cure for his degradation by any means necessary, Zack holds tight to the lessons of Angeal. Genesis, Angeal, and Sephiroth are all trans transformed into literal monsters over the course of this game, but Zack manages to hang on to himself the entire time. It's easy to make fun of Zack as a character. He's so eager to do what's right that he's earned a nickname amongst his friends, Zack the Puppy. But we're meant to identify with his purity and the turmoil that comes with bumping against the shadiness of Shinra. The entire story has a heavy dose of dramatic irony. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, then you know how Zack's journey ends and how it influences Cloud. But to me, seeing how Zack does his best to see the good in everyone makes his fate that much more heartbreaking. This is a man who infuses everything he does with dignity and honor. On the completion side, this translates to helping random kids with their problems, dealing with the weird and young Yuffie who hates Shinra but has a love-hate relationship with Zack, and even saving low-ranking Shinra grunts from revolting against Soldier. This also means helping Aerith build multiple flower carts until she's satisfied. Almost everything Zack does is out of selflessness, regardless of how 
much of a joke he may appear to those around him. And I appreciated how that doesn't always translate to just being courageous in battle. Zack wants to believe the best in everyone, very similarly to Aerith. The mirroring and parallels of story beats in Final Fantasy VII and Crisis Core works for me. Seeing beloved characters through Zack's wholesome eyes helps me appreciate them that much more. Aerith interacting with Zack is a bright spot. And even though their time in the game is relatively short, the chemistry is so there. Even though I love a bit of romance in a game like this, the real emotional weight in this game involves a huge piece of metal and what it means to two or three anime boys. Angeal carries around the original Buster Sword. Like the one that Cloud uses doesn't belong to Cloud, it belongs to Angeal. Zack notices that Angeal barely ever uses it, even in the throes of battle. Eventually, Zack finds out from Angeal's mother, Jillian, that the sword was crafted by Angeal's father. He created the weapon for his son when he was promoted to soldier first class. But in the process of making the sword, Angeal's father fell into debt and eventually worked himself to death trying to repay it. The weapon feels almost like a burden for Angeal, but it also symbolizes his father's hopes for him. And when Angeal realizes that his entire life is the result of a twisted Shinra experiment and that he is always dangerously close to hurting those around him by losing control, the sword gets passed on to Zack. Wielding the Buster Sword as Zack is more than just a gameplay change. Zack carries the weight of what that sword meant for Angeal and his family and vows to use the blade with the honor and respect it deserves. He becomes a leader when he starts carrying the Buster Sword and knows how much of an inspiration he can be to others. Of course, he doesn't know just how much this eventually will mean to Cloud and the impact it will have on his psyche as the time goes on. The scope of Crisis Core's narrative is absolutely wild if you look at it on the page. Clone soldiers, evil scientists, trust, betrayal, what happens when you confront hard truths, a play called Loveless that was taken taken from a sign and then turned into a weird Shakespearean thing that somehow resonates with the citizens of Midgard. What has always affected me the most is that no matter how dire the situation is, Zack remains morally consistent. He puts others before himself. And even if Soldier isn't everything he thought it was, he doesn't ever get discouraged. He tries to bring everyone up to his level. And if he can't do that, he defends them with everything he can. All of this clearly has an impact on Cloud, which makes the events in the last few chapters of Crisis Core even more painful. After six chapters of ping-ponging between tracking Genesis, grappling with Angeal's pain, getting to know and fall in love with Aerith and the other folks in the slums, we reach the point of no return with the trip to the infamous Nibelheim incident. Watching the unraveling of Sephiroth never gets old, even if I've seen it a million times at this point. The build-up to the destruction of the entire town and the fallout after the fact is mesmerizing. The final act of Crisis Core kicks off in chapter 8, and it hits just as hard as ever. Now, for those of you who kind of forgot what the Nibelheim incident is, Zack and Sephiroth visit Nibelheim, which is the town that Tifa and Cloud are from. There are rumors that there have been massive attacks to different townspeople and folk who work at the reactor that's in Nibelheim. Upon visiting said reactor, Sephiroth discovers that his mother, Genova, is being held captive there. Sephiroth, not knowing who his mom is, starts to do some research in the Shinra mansion in Nibelheim, and then he gets a god complex. He essentially realizes that he he is a monster that is a part of an alien that came before that is just focused on world domination. And suddenly he wants to take over the planet. From there, Zack tries to stop him. They fight. Sephiroth defeats Zack. And in that moment, Cloud, who is an infantry, mind you, at this point, grabs Zack's sword, kills Sephiroth, or at least kind of kills him. And then Zack and Cloud are then kidnapped, captured, and tortured and experimented on for years. After having a vision from Angeal, Zack wakes up in his own pod and manages to escape his confines and freeze Cloud. Zack discovers that Shinra has covered up the Nibelheim incident and has let Professor Hojo do whatever he wants to Zack and Cloud. The two make a desperate attempt to flee Nibelheim and with the help of the Turks, almost lose their pursuers time and time again. But Zack's fate is sealed. After wrapping things up with Angeal, Sephiroth, and Genesis, everything comes to a head. And thus the infamous scene in which Zack fights with every last breath in his body, he he fights, he fights, he fights, and he dies. And in his final breath, he gifts the Buster Sword to Cloud. 
Cloud, who this whole time has been covered in Mako poison, finally comes to. And Zack tells Cloud that Cloud will be his living legacy. Looking at the plot of Crisis Core, especially the end with the Genesis and Geo scientist stuff, it gets a little messy. It's overly indulgent, highly theatrical, and occasionally downright nonsense. All the scenes where Genesis is quoting from the play Loveless are pure gobbledygook. For whatever reason, the voice acting in this game is not as strong as the original PlayStation Portable version, even though the cast in this game is the same from Final Fantasy VII Remake. And I didn't have any issues with the voice acting in Remake. It kind of feels like as if the cast had had bad direction or were forced to perform the lines a certain way because the animations were locked for good about 15 years ago. But I can look past all this because I think embracing your dreams is important. Zack's bravery in the face of impossible odds is incredibly moving. It has been a North Star for me for this last decade and a half. His love for his friends, even people he barely knows, means something. And even when he's dying in the dirt, Zack knows exactly who he is and what he wants to lead to this world. Unlike Angeal, Sephiroth, and Genesis, Zack leaves the planet as if he knows exactly what he did, what he accomplished, and knows that Cloud will carry on his legacy. Unlike every other character in the Final Fantasy VII universe when confronted with an identity crisis, Zack grows from the experience and sticks to his guns, or in this case, sword. Once Zack gets the Buster Sword and the momentum kicks in, it is a landslide to the end. But of course, completion complicates momentum. And I also found myself grappling with some unrealized expectations. As far as endgame content goes, there isn't much outside of one of the most time-consuming, tiresome secret boss fights ever in a game. Now, obviously there are 300 missions in the game, but as you get closer towards the end, anything in the category that's 9, 5, 1 through 6 is rough. Eventually, 966 will lead you to a battle against the mega boss and goddess herself, Minerva, who has 10 million HP. That's right, 10 million, except it's not 10 million for me. Remember, I'm completing this game on hard mode, which means Minerva has a whopping 77,777,777 hit points. In the original version of the game, this fight was a great place to farm Phoenix Downs by stealing them from the boss, dying and wiping, and then selling all 99 Phoenix Downs, taking all of that money and maxing out all of your materia via materia fusion, and then suddenly you can turn back around and beat this boss like it owes you lunch money. But that's not the case here. The developers fixed it this time around, so if you die, you do not keep the items you stole if you then wipe. And let me tell you, with Reunion, this fight on hard mode requires insane patience. This essentially is what I had to go through, all right? So I used a dual cast materia to pair with Kiraga to ensure that when I would use my spells, they would cast twice in a row, as Minerva is just a beast. Included in that, Minerva does a move that removes your Phoenix Down status. For those of you that don't know, Phoenix Downs are auto revives in this game. So if you get hit by that slash, you lose your revive and you're vulnerable to wiping out again. So you have to constantly keep those Phoenix Downs on. Here's the other big issue. Now the meta game here that usually makes people really excited to play and break this game is the move Costly Punch. It's easy to get. If you have a huge HP cap, this move is amazing. So how it works is Costly Punch takes your maximum HP, converts it as damage and boom you do a lot of damage if you had more than your max hp via the dmw bonuses the damage would be one they fixed it in reunion so now costly punch is now effective again except in this fight it's not because if you think about it it's going to take a long time to costly punch this goddess down to hell so what is the ultimate way to get through this fight it's unfortunate that i have to say this but if you want to conquer minerva on the hardest setting and not spend hours and hours and hours in in that one particular fight, you need to farm for millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of gill, and then use the skill Gill Toss. By doing so, you will throw five golden coins that each do 99,999 damage, which means you are doing 500,000 points worth of damage in these hits. And at that same time, you're losing $500,000 in gill. I needed to have no less than 30 
million gil going into the fight. And even at that, I ran out. And to ration my gil towards the end, I would throw gil from the Buster Sword battle stance, which would crit oftentimes. And even at that, it was an insane fight that took almost 45 minutes. The point is, playing on normal, very easy, very fun fight. Playing on hard, get on my level, you Shinra scrubs. Did I mention that I did this twice? Yeah, I did it twice because this game has new game plus mode. You don't get anything and I had to double check that you get nothing because that's what I do. And hey, maybe they added something. I don't know. But here's something incredible I found out while doing my second final fight with Minerva. The first time I fought Minerva, I did not have 100% proficiency to my Buster Sword. But now I do going into this fight. If you switch into the battle stance with the sword, you automatically will get full immunity blocks. This is huge. It makes the fight with Minerva much easier as all you have to do is go into power stance and wait whenever you're not fast enough to dodge. What's dumb about this, the game never tells you this when you get to max proficiency. So look at that. You do get something very useful for having fully maxed out your proficiency. In the end, that seems very much worth it to me. Confusion and all. In the end, I did 300 missions twice, which means 600 missions. And that includes farming for all the different money and SP and materia items and everything. Look, whenever I hear activating combat mode, think of me saying it with glee and pain. Seeing the trophy pop for finally beating Minerva was gratifying. But I will say, for you lucky folk out there who want the easy platinum, there is no trophy for beating Minerva on hard mode. There's a trophy for beating the game on hard mode. But like my most recent luck, if you don't want to play the game on hard mode, you can play on normal, get to the very end, and then switch it. Obviously, by doing all the missions and doing all the big fights, you'll get the entire Genji suite. The Genji armor, like the shield, the armor, the helm, the gloves, they all do great game-breaking things. All of these things circle the drain about breaking your HP. HP limits across the board. See, your limits are limited to 9999 damage, HP, MP, all that stuff. But with all the Genji gear and the Divine Soul, it breaks all of that to give you 99,999 in almost every way. Damage, HP, MP, AP, all that stuff, right? When you complete all of the missions, you unlock something called Heike Soul. So Heike Soul does a lot of game-breaking things. It is a great item to receive after putting in all of the hard work. It turns off your DMW meter, so you can't limit break with the characters but that's okay because in place of that you can essentially inflict any status element in the game including death upon basic attack enemies disintegrate in real time when you equip it when you take damage it will often convert that damage into sp which is the points that are used to fuel the dmw meter essentially Heike soul is like equipping one of almost every single accessory in the game at the same time it's really really game breaking and it's a cursed ring which means with the dmw not taking any of your sp you will actually bulk up EXP. TLDR, uh, I was level 87. I wore this thing for a large portion of my new game plus playthrough. I took it off and after one mission, I went from 87 to 99 instantly because I had banked that much XP and the DMW meter was not moving. See, this game is just so fun to break. In the end, new game plus itself feels very unnecessary, even if it is fun to get the perfect combat strategies and max out all the material even further. I know logically that the original version of Crisis Core was created long before there was any talk of a large scale remake of Final Fantasy 7. OG Crisis Core was an admirable attempt to fill in some story gaps, mostly successful, sometimes not. But what surprised me most was that Crisis Core Reunion does not address the biggest implication of Final Fantasy 7 Remake, which I thought would be why old fans would be playing this game again and new fans would have extreme interest. So when I complete games, it is generally with low expectations. I rarely expect any kind of completion bonus and if there is one fantastic but with this particular game i may have let expectations get the better of me because one of the greatest twists of final fantasy 7 remake is that zach fair may or may not be dead zach might be alive so if Zack is alive in Final Fantasy VII Remake, what does that mean for Cloud? What does that mean for Aerith? Does Cloud have to give the sword back to Zack? And then does Zack join the team? Does Aerith reboot her relationship with Zack? Does it clear up all the confusion about the Nibelheim incident? It's a question that anyone who completed Final Fantasy VII Remake is still grappling with. And one we won't know the full implications of for who knows how long until the next game. Part of me really wanted this game to address Zack's implied fate a little bit from Remake in a meaningful way. And that's not the case here. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion is a 
faithful recreation of the PlayStation Portable story with beautiful high-res graphics. There are no hidden nods to unresolved plot threads, no indication that events may be played out differently in the end. There is still a stinger that mirrors the opening of Final Fantasy VII, but this version intercuts some scenes from Remake to better tie the universe together. Very subtly, very, very subtly. Again, I fully acknowledge that this is more on me, but come on. As one of the biggest Crisis Core fans on planet Earth, the fact that we got a remake is incredible. So where am I left after completing Crisis Core yet again for what would be the fourth time in my life? I'm grateful to play it on the modern hardware cycle. I'm glad that everyone can enjoy it now. It's no longer in preservation hell. And I'm glad that diehard fans of the original and new people who are coming straight from Remake have the chance to experience Reunion. As a completion experience, there is a lot to do for sure, but not a lot of that feels very rewarding. The highlights of Crisis Core to me will always be the strong characters, the themes of always looking for the good in others, but more importantly, Zack's honor, dignity, and legacy, and how that will always forever stick with Cloud will always resonate with me. The TLDR, in case you're still here, Zack Fair is what Cloud pretends to be, and this story is that. I don't fault Crisis Core for not being more than what anyone else expected. From a preservation standpoint alone, I am incredibly happy that this game is available for a much wider audience. The battle system remains unique, and though the mountain of missions can be draining, I will always love Zack's journey from the puppy to true soldier. The story's conclusion delivers, as there is a lot to love about Crisis Core's character depictions. Reunion is a worthwhile adventure if you're a fan of Final Fantasy VII. Thanks for watching, and remember, stay honorable, dignified, and honest. See you guys later. Happy New Year. Can you believe Zack prays to this sword like this? Who does this? He puts it against his head. It's painful. Who does this? Embrace your dreams into your face, is what he says every time. <laughs>